The Galactic Senate has been the governing body of the Star Wars galaxy for most of the last 25,000 years of galactic history. It was formed at the birth of the Old Republic and was reformed under the New Republic and Galactic Alliance. It even survived in a more toothless form under the Galactic Empire, where it was technically intact until around the Battle of Yavin, before being finally dissolved by the Emperor. Despite being such a prevalent feature of the galaxy far, far away, details of how it works are typically few and far between, and sometimes they conflict depending on which sources you consult. So today, we're going to try to break down what we know and a bit of what we don't know about how the Senate works, how representation within it works and changes over time, the presence of political parties or the lack thereof, and the election and functions of the Supreme Chancellor or Chief of State. The Senate was established in the year 25,053 before the Battle of Yavin or BBY by the Constitution of the Republic, which set out the powers of the Senate and other parts of the government, including the Senate's authority over matters of trade and the military. While it includes a separation of powers between the judiciary, executive, and legislative branches intended to make sure a system of checks and balances would be in place and keep each branch answerable to someone, the Senate does have a mix of legislative and executive power, with many executive positions being filled by senators. The legislative branch is basically responsible for writing laws, while the executive branch is responsible for actual day-to-day -day governance, along with determining the direction as well as execution of policy and the civil service. The chief executive, called the chancellor, president, or chief of state in the republic and its successor states, is elected from among the many sitting senators, the process for which we'll cover later on in this video. And their primary role is to serve as the president of the Senate, on top of other executive functions, including being the commander-in-chief of the military at times where such a military exists, which wasn't always the case in the Republic. In the Republic, the head of state and head of government are the same person, which is the case in certain real-world governments, though not always. It's the case in the United States, but for example, in the United Kingdom or Canada, you have the Prime Minister as the head of government, but then you have the Queen as the head of state, even though currently the monarchy doesn't execute any real power. There are plenty of real-life examples of countries that have a prime minister, but also have a president who does not just fill a ceremonial role. As the head of government, the chief of state or supreme chancellor is the leader of the grouping of senators and other officials who run different departments of the government. Usually these are a mix of civilian and military representatives on different councils. We have a lot more information on the specifics of this in the New Republic era compared to the Old Republic era, but we'll get to all of that later. While well, technically being a parliamentary republic, the position of chancellor in practice is probably more recognizable as being similar to prime ministers in modern Westminster parliamentary systems like Canada or the United Kingdom when it comes to actual functions. In these systems, the prime minister generally serves as the head of government within the legislature, which is part of why in technical form it may resemble the presidential system in the United States more. In practice, because of their connections to the Senate directly, it does end up looking more like the Westminster systems. It's more convention than law that this position of prime minister needs to come from within the elected officials in these real systems, even if in practice that's almost always the case. But with the Galactic Senate, this is a real direct requirement under most circumstances. The Supreme Chancellor or Chief of State is elected from within the body of sitting senators. There were situations where non-sitting senators could be Chief of State in the New Republic at the very least, when the death or otherwise indisposition of the sitting Chief of State allows for the emergency appointment of either a member of the Advisory Council, which is made up of senators from the most important sectors in the Republic, or, in an example that happened several times in universe, a former chief of state may be temporarily appointed, which led to the rebel leader and first chief of state of the New Republic, Mon Mothma, retaking the position temporarily while not being a sitting member of the Senate at all. We'll cover the election of new chancellors or chief of state later in the video. We don't have much detail on how a theoretical chancellor or head of government position worked under the Imperial Senate, where obviously there was no election for Palpatine's position as emperor, but it is possible that the position still existed, if only to fill the function as a president of the Senate, like the American Vice President, rather than having any real executive power still invested in them, which would have all been taken on by the Emperor, of course. We do know that for a long time under the Empire, the Senate was still a factor worth considering. A lot of the dialogue in Episode 4 points to this fact. So it's not impossible that there was a position within the Senate that acted as a basically Prime Minister, 
in a system where a reigning monarch still did have most of the actual power, similar to how older parliamentary systems in the real world would have actually functioned. We know Palpatine did at least have his own direct representative in Sessions, Massa Meta, who had served as both his vice-chancellor earlier on, and who was a member of the Imperial Ruling Council. Massa Meta had also served as vice-chair or Speaker of the House, who basically maintains order and procedure in the Senate, a position which was maintained and held under the New Republic by respected statesman Ben Kil Nam during the Black Fleet Crisis of 17 ABY. Obviously, even if someone like Massa Meta was technically acting in the position of a kind of prime minister, they would still have been acting entirely under the wishes of Palpatine, so functionally it doesn't make that much of a difference. While I'm sure Palpatine would love to believe he was the galaxy's special unique little boy and that the Galactic Empire is what we most associate with the situation of uprooting the way the head of state was chosen, there have actually been other much longer periods where the Republic turned into a de facto monarchy or imperial system under a ruling dynasty where the typical methods and mechanisms of electing a chancellor seem to have fallen by the wayside in practice, if not by law. The most prominent non-Palpatine example of this is probably the humanocentric religious cult of the Pious Day, in Chancellors Contispex 1 through Contispex 19, over a span of a thousand years from roughly 12,000 to 11,000 years before the Battle of Yavin. During this period, the constant tensions between humans and other species came to a head in humanocentric policies and anti-alien crusades, to an even greater extent than under Palpatine and the xenophobic imperial ideals of the human high culture. These ideals existed in some form for the entire history of the Republic, and resulted in several wars, arguably including the Clone Wars and Palpatine's empire to a large extent. So even if the Galactic Empire and Palpatine do hold a much more prominent position in Star Wars media, if you look at it from simply an in-universe perspective, it wasn't necessarily the biggest break in the Republic in its 25,000 year history. But now let's move on to the Senate itself. The mechanisms of representation are how senators are selected and who they represent fluctuated over time, and were often subject to harsh criticism. Originally, planets were represented directly in the Senate by their own individual senator, but as the Republic grew into thousands of inhabited worlds, this made debate cumbersome at best and gridlock became the norm, so the Senate moved to representation by newly formed sectors. In these new sectors, senators would represent groups of worlds. These groups could not legally exceed 50 planets, out of fear that an individual sector may grow too strong and challenge the authority or stability of the Republic as a whole. While this had some clear advantages in combating earlier gridlock, to strict galactic constitutionalists this was what was called the founding tyranny of the Republic, according to the Essential Atlas. Some individual powerful worlds kept their own representatives, possibly set up as a retcon for most of the centers we see in media being direct planet representatives, and often this meant in practice one particularly powerful world in a sector would be represented, while the others had no real representation at all, concentrating power in a few worlds that were typically more towards the galactic core. To help alleviate the controversy caused by certain planets having a single vote themselves, and likely to help alleviate some lore conflicts where we usually do see senators referred to as being for a particular world rather than sector, any non-senator who was a recognized representative of an inhabited member world was given the right to address the seated senate, which remained a right recognized well into the New Republic period. While the reorganization into sectors helped at first, the number of sectors still ballooned over time, stretching into millions of representatives again. The so-called solution to this at first in the early Republic was to split the senate into seated and unseated representatives with again most power concentrated in the seated senators, predictably representing richer worlds or sectors, and requiring smaller sectors or worlds to once again subject their needs or interests to the whims of the already powerful, primarily core-located worlds. While they could still address the Senate, any hope of having votes going their way required significant concessions or trading of favors to the seated richer worlds or sectors. At the end of the Great Sith Wars in 1000 BBY, the Rusan Reformations took place under Chancellor Tarsus Valorum, ancestor of Chancellor Finnis Valorum, who preceded Palpatine in the position. While these reforms were most famous for abolishing the Republic's standing military and putting strict limits on militarization by planets, sectors, and other entities in the Republic, it also overhauled the structure of the Senate. Sectors were streamlined and rebuilt, 
reducing their number to 1,024 regional sectors, each represented by one senator. There was one further hugely controversial and majorly impactful change. The allowance of Senate representation for what were called functional constituencies. These constituencies on the more helpful side could include species or national blocs, which seems to be how groups like the Alderanians and Kamasi remnant, whose home planets had been destroyed, were able to retain direct representation. But it was also used for direct representation by corporate interests. This is how the Trade Federation was able to achieve that status and be represented directly in the Senate. Basically, it's like if Amazon or Coke was determined to be hugely politically influential, and instead of just buying a senator like a good respectable corporation, they were just given their own seats directly, though of course they did still buy other senators, why wouldn't you? With many of these corporations directly or indirectly controlling worlds, this could even lead to double representation for them in some situations. Structurally, the Republic is best described as a federation, broadly meaning a union state of different constituent states with independent levels of government, each given clear or distinct legal powers. Neither the top-level federal government nor the constituent state governments can unilaterally modify or nullify each other. Canada, for example, is a federation made up of provinces and the USA is made up of states, and other federations have other breakdowns of member entities representing different groups. Compare this to a unitary state, where you may have different levels of government, but each is typically just an administrative division created by and for the convenience of the overall government. You can also think of the individual states and provinces themselves as unitary governments, where they do also have subnational units in cities, but those cities are created and modified by the provincial governments at their discretion. There are entire university courses made up of exploring the different specific expressions of federalism versus unitary states, but those basics will do for us today. While the Republic is a federation, and is generally a pretty decentralized one at that, the way representation is organized in the Senate itself, and the way the member states are constituted is somewhat atypical of most federations, largely as a result of the issues with the sheer scope of the Republic which we've already talked a bit about. Our best case study for how sectoral representation works in practice comes from the Naboo senatorial delegation in the prequels and connected media. Palpatine and Padme Amidala both get referenced as the senators from Naboo, but this is shorthand for being the representatives of the Chamul sector as a whole, which, even though it was considered a backwater, still had 36 direct member systems in the Republic and 40,000 total inhabited worlds. Representation and voting in the Senate was headed by the Chamal sector senator, but there were other legal representatives within the delegation appointed by the Galactic Representative Commission, who, while not senators themselves, were intended to represent other groups within the sector beyond who the senator could reasonably speak for directly, a position held by Representative Jar Jar Binks of the Gungans, for example. Based on Jar Jar's position and actions in the prequels, a representative could sometimes be granted the proxy powers of the sitting senator, not dissimilar from the system of seated and unseated senators mentioned earlier. The novel Cloak of Deception also mentions Amidala's willingness or lack thereof to vote on certain policies. However, this was at a time prior to Episode 1, when Palpatine was the senator, and Amidala probably wouldn't have been in a position to actually vote. She was the Queen of Naboo, which was basically the position of Governor of Naboo or President there, rather than being a seated member of the Senate. There is the possibility that in the Old Republic at the very least, while the Supreme Chancellor had to be the sitting senator, they may have been replaced in that role upon their election to the higher office. There are situations where two senators represent the same area, like the Grand Protectorate, where we know Ainley Team and Max Lowe were joint representatives, presumably speaking for Malastare and the Dustig sector as a whole, on top of what was known as the Grand Protectorate, which was possibly one of those functional constituencies we mentioned earlier, leading to a possible situation of double-dipping on representation, where the Dustig sector senator was almost always a Gran, and the Grand Protectorate had a representative who would often have the same interests. We also have the Mon Calamari sector in the New Jedi Order series, where for most of the series we have Senator Puo as the representative, a member of the Quarren species, rather than the Mon Calamari species, which typically represented the sector. But there was also a Mon Calamari named Gran Marab, who was referenced in three books, starting with James Lucino's Heroes Trial as being a senator from that sector. 
While senators are generally elected, usually local customs on the most powerful world in a sector would win out in how successors were chosen, and the senator would consistently be from that world, as we see with Naboo, where the sitting senator's aide would typically be the next in line for the Senate seat, though they would have to be confirmed by a vote. There were at least some times when this wouldn't be the case, and a less major planet would have their candidate win out as with Senator Janice Grijadis from Chamal Minor, who represented the sector instead of someone from Naboo. So, within the Federation, you have your more local or planetary or regional governments, which have their own clear jurisdictions and powers, and you have the federal government with your representative in the federal government being separate from the local government. To reiterate, your governor is not your senator, or your Queen Amidala is not your Senator Amidala. So when you hear about senators from certain planets, it's easy to think of that person as the quote-unquote leader of that world or sector, but that is not usually true. The Senate is a meeting of legislators operating as members of the federal government, not a collection of mayors, governors, or other executives organizing. In certain cases, the senator could also be a local monarch or other local government leader rather than an elective representative, though that is the exception and not the rule. It's also an example of the fact that the Republic follows democratic principles within the federal level, but does not necessarily mandate them as a requirement for a planet or system to be a member of the Federation. There were certain periods where the Republic was a more centralized Federation, meaning more powers rested at the federal rather than more local levels, especially as the Clone Wars went on. But the specific devolution of powers also seems to have varied from planet to planet, which is again atypical. There are plenty of real-world examples where specific provinces or states or different groups within a country will get or at least ask for different powers from what are typically afforded to more local levels of government, but these are almost always very controversial debates within a country. The incongruity between how sectors are represented and how local governments were actually organized is something which tends to present a problem within federalist systems as well. Ultimately, while the problem of the sheer size of the Senate is not easy to overcome, the sectoral solutions as they existed are, to put it nicely, not elegant, or at least lead to some structural and institutional elements of the Republic which are not typical for federations, and generally not healthy for federations, though which don't necessarily break the definition. Normally, federations have some degree of mapping the legislative representatives at the federal level to administrative units at the subnational level. There not being a one-to-one correlation between representatives in a federal body like the Senate and real administrative units at a different level isn't weird on its own, congressional districts or federal ridings would typically not be reflective of a whole government at a different level, but they're usually smaller parts of a larger existing subnational unit. And with most federal systems where there's two houses of the legislature, known as bicameral systems, at least one of the houses is structured as a collection of the constituent regions. For example, how the United States has the Senate, which has two senators from each state. Effectively, this is meant to represent all of the federated entities coming together to talk on that level. Even if the system is very centralized, the federated body, so the upper level, exists more or less as an agreement between the federated entities. At first glance, the Republic may seem to be going for this model with its sector representation, but the sectors are direct creations of, and their boundaries are frequently modified by, the federal government. Except in the example of the functional constituencies mentioned before, they don't actually exist as, or even reflect, administrative units themselves beyond that. So it's more like if, rather than having two senators per state in the American system, they had one senator representing California, Oregon, and Washington simultaneously something which is generally not in line with how federal systems are meant to work, in which most states in a federal system would likely see as an unacceptable reduction in that region's power. And to be clear, it is not about where the different powers end up lying once you're determining whether the federal government or lower levels of government have more power, it's about whether the representation of those groups is properly accomplished at the federal level. Even if you have a more highly centralized federation, the different groups within the federation are still more likely to feel like it's a legitimate expression of sovereign power if they don't feel like they're being glossed over by the construction of the subnational groups, or in the construction of how their federal-level representatives are chosen. 
especially for the smaller states who would never reasonably expect to even have a direct voice in the system at all. Usually, in federal systems, those kinds of changes would require the assent of some portion of the constituent members. So it's possible they agreed to the changes as they happened, but it's also possible the criteria for passing such an amendment relied more heavily on the approval of the richer planetary governments, whose interests this structure is aligned with. Without getting too deep into a discussion of how nationalism or a political identity is constructed, or the gaps that these systems will always leave no matter what basis you use, a federation does exist as a collection of these polities, meaning the member planets. So the idea that they're not reflected at the national level in some form is at the very least abnormal, and at worst hugely problematic. You wouldn't usually have a federation form like this. This is particularly problematic, for example, in sectors where the representative ends up being a local monarch. Even assuming this was in accordance with the wishes of every single one of their own subjects somehow, sector borders rarely coincide with the borders of these governed states, so that becomes an issue. The Wookiees and Trandoshans, for another example, would always fit under the same representative or delegation here, despite the fact that Trandoshans hunted Wookiees regularly, and under this model the Duros would probably have several colony sectors represented, the Neomoidians, for example, were actually a Duros offshoot with plenty of senatorial power, but Duro itself would only be represented by the Corellian senator, along with the Salonians, the Drawl, and a variety of other worlds and species. I actually don't think we ever have an example of a sitting Duro senator, so this checks out. In Mon Calamari, the example I mentioned earlier of Senator Puo being a rarity as a Quarren is another example of a significant intense relationship where representation always went to the Mon Calamari. On the out-of-universe side, though, this is definitely an area where you're most likely to find sources varying on what exactly a senator is and who they're meant to represent. A lot of stories, for narrative purposes especially, do work with the assumption that the galaxy is smaller than it ends up being. In my opinion, if you want a headcanon it in some way to have it make the most sense, the best way to do it is probably the idea that some additional delegates or representatives are sometimes referred to as senators, rather than as whatever their actual title is. Even though this is a super long video analyzing a part of Star Wars in way too much depth, it's important to remember that most of this is cobbled together from different areas of storytelling with different goals, rather than reflecting some external reality so nothing is ever going to be applied entirely consistently. But to get back to some of the ways that Senate representation can be a little bit broken, even on a planetary level in the Grand Protectorate on Malastare, which we mentioned as being represented before directly, representation of the sector almost always went to leading members of the Protectorate, until it was presumably destroyed in the Yuzon Vong War. The Dug species, who had been the planet's original inhabitants, lost a series of wars to the Grands, and they remained essentially unrepresented at any level. Even at the federal level, the Grand Protectorate Act was passed in 1000 BBY, forcibly resettling the entirely unrepresented Dugs to an undeveloped continent on Malastare. Obviously, getting too far into the weeds of how representation works would have been unhelpful for a movie, so as shorthand having senators from Naboo makes perfect sense, but as we discussed earlier with how sectors formed over time, this is not purely an out-of-universe critique extrapolated onto the system. It was a set of problems established and baked into the system. None of this is to say that the Republic is unique in this, or that federations in the real world are always perfectly organized and immune to any of these problems. Like I've said earlier, this is a far more complex situation, and the example of the Dugs and Grand Protectorate is one with plenty of real-life analogs. The distinction I am trying to make is that the setup of the Republic takes even more extra steps than usual to exacerbate these issues by essentially taking some of the less helpful aspects of a federation and combining them with some of the less helpful elements of a unitary state. What you might expect in a more typical federal system, where they're struggling with the sheer volume of representatives they'd be dealing with at the highest federal level otherwise, would be that there is an additional level between whatever local governments exist and the Galactic Senate. So a sector government level, which acts as a federation of the planetary system or other local forms of government, and which is then itself the next level before the Galactic Senate. In some respects, you could think of the European Union as an example of what kind of model I'm talking about there. And if you were to look at the planetary level, several planets in Star Wars likely had a federal government level of their own. So the idea of a nesting doll of federalism is not a unique or original idea either in or out of universe. We already covered the fact that different sectors would certainly have different levels of unity or integration, 
So this may be more or less of a problem in some areas, but the fact that the sectors tended to exist by the convenience of the federal government, rather than by any other unifying factor, does point to some massive issues which were brought up regularly by the detractors of the Republic, and probably contributed to the dissidents that boiled over into the Clone Wars or other conflicts throughout galactic history. This superseding of the local levels by the federal level became even more the case with the appointment of sector governors and then moffs, who governed the sectors directly on behalf of the late Republic and then Empire, bypassing the pre-existing individual local governments on behalf of an increasingly more centralized federation and a sector which had no outside bearing on reality. This may sound in some ways more in line with what I was mentioning before as an intermediate federal level between the Republic and local governments, but keep in mind a federation is meant to be a collaboration between these different levels of government, which exist separately, not each level being a creation of and directly subservient to the highest level. The legal jurisdiction of the sector governments were no longer constitutionally enshrined separate powers from those of the federal, but were now instead devolved responsibilities answerable directly to the federal level and which could be reassigned by the imperial government at will. And again, while these sector moffs and governors may be more identifiable with the empire, these did exist under the republic as well, though it was all reversed by the new republic. Now that we have at least a rough idea of how senators are chosen and who they represent, we know that senators can individually write, propose, and vote on legislation, but how are those votes organized? In most, but not all, real-world parliamentary bodies, most members are affiliated with a political party, which serve a few purposes. Aside from generally being a grouping of like-minded legislators, political parties tended to play practical purposes as well. In a system where the government, meaning the position of head of government and associated cabinet, council, or committee memberships, is based on retaining what's called the confidence of the House, or the idea that major legislation or programs run by the government are likely to receive the assent by the legislature, parties help ensure that's the case. Usually this comes with the idea of party discipline, in the position of the party whip, a member who ensures that party members are instructed on how to vote with their party's platform. This also comes with added benefits of campaign funding, name recognition, and so on, making it far more easy to run as a party member than as an independent. There are many times when voting is not required to be along party lines, also known as voting your conscience, but failure to adhere to party discipline on votes where it's required can result in what's called removing the whip, or kicking that member out of the party. Star Wars tends to not have these kinds of strict parties. There are different political blocs and some organizations that act like parties in some ways, but whether by convention or by rules preventing it, senators in the Galactic Senate largely do not form true political parties as we would recognize them. This is what's called a non-partisan democracy, and there are real-world examples of this as well. Instead, associations are made on a more per-issue basis. A discussion between Palpatine and the leaders of the future separatist groups in the previously mentioned Cloak of Deception by James Lucino does have the leaders of the conglomerates refer to party whip positions, so the concept or practice was at least not entirely unheard of, and may have been practiced in some more limited forms than in the real world. For example, Cloak of Deception further describes issues of partisanship often deciding elections, but instead of the blocks being formed around specific political parties, they were loose associations formed around regional interests. Specifically, areas like the Galactic Core, the Colonies, the Inner Rim, Mid Rim, and Outer Rim having aligned voting interests, nominally led by different figures. There was an election upcoming in this pre-Episode 1 period, where the Core Worlds led by Senator Bail Antilles supported the incumbent Finnis Valorum, while the Outer Rim delegates supported Ainley Team of Malastare, for example and it was understood that these groupings of senators would vote specific ways and adhere to guidelines of their respective leaders, even if those parties and leaders were a convenience and could shift more fluidly, rather than being a solid construct with any institutional weight. This continued into the New Republic, where we hear about the Rights of Sentience Party from the book Planet of Twilight, which was an association of senators aligned in the belief that when it came to matters of colonialism, Native sentient species should have equal or greater say than colonists. While we're talking primarily about the Legends continuity here, the new canon does have two similarly informal party structures in the fledgling Senate after Endor, the Centris and the Populace. The Centris, rather than being the middle of a political spectrum, were more in favor of centralizing power and strengthening the military, based more on the imperial system 
where the populists, the party led by Leia Organa, were in favor of greater planetary autonomy. For some to the point of wanting to abolish the New Republic entirely. There are plenty of implications of the presence or lack of presence parties can have in a political system. For one example, lack of partisan concerns can mean each representative is more free to vote on each issue how their constituents might want. On the other, reaching consensus on issues can become much more difficult, and so it's much more difficult to get anything done. Elections and forming a government, along with holding on to power for a government, does become somewhat trickier without more ingrained political parties, since a government's ability to form and stay in power is based on its ability to hold the confidence of the House, meaning that it can get those all-important majority of votes on important issues. When we see cabinets being formed in Star Wars without parties, there's far more examples of throwing around individual weight for political favors as well. With that said though, how exactly do elections in the formation of a government work in Star Wars? In-universe, we get allusions to the fact that Mon Mothma's successor, Leia Organa Solo, had been directly appointed by Mon Mothma, but in terms of our takeaways for how the system works, it's more likely implying that, rather than being a direct appointment, Mon Mothma simply endorsed Leia as her possible successor, and the massive popularity of both Mon Mothma and Leia made the vote a foregone conclusion. So when elections actually do happen, how do they work? We actually have two really good examples to work with here. The election of Palpatine in 32 BBY in the Republic, and the election of Cal Omas in 28 ABY in the New Republic, both of which show some different elements, so we'll go over both. There were other elections which get mentioned or where we do get a very broad overview, like the elections of Leontine Suresh in 3640 BBY, and multiple elections of 44 ABY, but none go into anywhere near as much detail as those first two. I've actually done full breakdown videos of each of these elections on their own, which I will link, so while we'll be covering some similar ground, I won't go too deep into the electoral play-by-play -play here. Instead, we're focusing on the systems. We're actually going to start with the later of the two elections, the 28 ABY one covered in the novel Destiny's Way. This election, while later in the timeline, goes into a bit more depth on the specifics of how Cal Omas won, including vote percentage breakdowns. He was running as a kind of pro-Jedi candidate during the Yuuzhan Vong War in the final election before he reorganized the New Republic into the Galactic Alliance. The elections for Chancellor or President did not involve voting by the general populace. Instead, sitting senators were able to run, and the election took place within the Senate itself. Multiple candidates were able to run, and in order to win the elections in the New Republic, you had to receive a majority of the votes by the senators, rather than just a plurality. So you had to actually get higher than 50% of the vote at the end of the day, rather than just receiving, say, 40% when there were two other candidates that got 30 and 30. Every prior New Republic election to this one seemed to have been landslides in single rounds by Leia, Mon Mothma, and Borsphalia, but in Destiny's Way, we see several rounds of voting among multiple candidates. By the time the first round of voting happens in 28 ABY, there were still five candidates in the running, and no candidate receives higher than Fire Rodin, who has 35%. Cal Omas is behind at 28%, and the lowest candidate, the aforementioned Puo of Mon Calamari, receives only three votes total, and becomes a running joke for the whole election. Weirdly, this system does not seem to have a mechanism to forcibly reduce the candidates after each round of voting. We see plenty of negotiations for cabinet positions or points of policy by the winner in exchange for support from the other candidates, leading to those candidates lagging further behind dropping out of the race and endorsing them, but we never see Puo as the clear loser of every round stop being included in the race. He does increase his vote total to 4 by the end of it, so I guess that's good for him? You'd think there must be some mechanism to stop deadlocks, but what it is, we have no idea. By the third round of voting, there had only been one dropout, the Twi'lek Senator Kola Kui, who had won 10% of the first round vote and endorsed Cal Omas in exchange for an eventual seat on the Commerce Council. By the fourth and final round, there had only been a single other dropout, Godel Senator Talam Ranth, who had received about 20% per round, and who endorsed Cal Omas in exchange for being able to continue his existing position as chair of the Justice Council, though his support had already begun flocking to Omas. In the final round, Omas went from 46% of the vote to 85% and secured the election, his competition having been reduced to Fire Rodin, a fervently anti-Jedi candidate. 
in sad, useless Senator Puo. Many votes were swayed by Talon Card and Lando Calrissian, who threatened to expose senators for accepting bribes if they did not support Omas, which leads to a whole other topic of corruption in Republic elections for a whole different video. Palpatine's election is far less clear in its process as far as how many votes are required to win, but it does have some other interesting points. Like we've already covered, parties don't necessarily exist as institutions, but Palpatine's opponent, Bail Antilles of Alderaan and Ainley Team of Malastare, did represent the Core and Rim factions respectively. Antilles was basically the spiritual successor to Finnis Valorum, as the candidate for the Core representatives, despite having opposed him on several points. And while Ainley Team came from the Outer Rim faction, he was not actually seen as their leading figure. The real leader of the Rim faction was Twi'lek Senator Orn Free Ta, who actually broke with his faction in the election and backed Palpatine. Unlike Omas's election, we don't have the vote amounts. There was only one round of voting that we know about, so much like the victories of Mon Mothma and Leia, it's similarly possible that Palpatine won over 50% of the votes in a single round. But it's also possible the election simply went to whichever individual candidate had the most votes after one round in that period, or that there was a built-in ranked choice. We do know that Palpatine's election was not a landslide though, despite his growing popularity and ability to play to people's sympathies with the Naboo's ongoing crisis. Even getting 51% of the vote compared to 25 and 24 would seem like a landslide to me, so it seems like that probably isn't what happened there. Whatever the specifics are, once the Chancellor is elected, they have the ability to appoint several members of key committees and councils which have a variety of different functions depending on the period. We don't hear quite as much about them in the Old Republic, but the New Republic has several iterations of ruling councils, advisory councils, and specific issue departments run by collections of senators and other figures. We already mentioned with the election of Cal Omas how often these were traded out as political favors for support during elections. The New Republic ruling council was probably the most important council, including the chief of state themselves, as well as the chairs of multiple other councils, the defense, military, commerce, justice, and science and tech councils, as well as the security and intelligence council. While these were seemingly appointed by the chief of state, the nature of elections and the government meant that often the people holding these chairs may be political opponents of the chief of state. Borsfalia, for example, often opposed Leia and Mon Mothma, though he held the chair of Security and Intelligence Council during Leia's tenure, largely based on the contributions of the Bothans to these areas during the rebellion before he himself became elected Chief of State. That's going to do it for our breakdown of the Senate and federalism in the Republic. I hope you've enjoyed the video, and if so, consider leaving a like or subscribing for more. It really does help the channel out, so I very much appreciate it. I'm hoping to cover other broader topics like this in the future, both here on Datapad as well as in collaboration with some others in an upcoming future project. If you do want to see more videos about topics like this, or even just videos this length on other topics in Star Wars, please consider leaving a comment letting me know or sharing the video around somewhere, because these really do take a lot of time, and the more it gets out there, the more I'm able to justify spending this amount of time on a single video. If there are any specific topics you want to see me cover, let me know in the comments as well. Either way, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.